Welcome everybody, we'll get started in just a few minutes. Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a couple more minutes. Hello everyone. Welcome to Building a DocuSign Single Page App with Cores. My name is Melissa Marsh from our Developer Programs Marketing Team, and I'll be moderating and running our backend logistics today. Uh, Brandon, next slide. Oh, uh, the team slide with the introduction. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm here with Brendan Alexander, our lead product manager, who will be presenting and demoing today, along with Tony Bo, senior software engineer, Samuel O, oh, senior soft or, uh, software engineer, Simon Garrett, uh, manager and of engineering, and Cole Kleinstuber, senior developer support engineer. Um, these folks will all be addressing questions via the Q&A box throughout the session and after the demo when we open up the floor to questions. Now, before we get started, I'm gonna go over some housekeeping items. So if we could go to the Q&A slide. Next slide, Brendan. All right, um, you are placed in listen-only mode and this session is being recorded. You'll receive an email in about a week with a link to the webinar recording along with other resources. Please be sure to use the Q&A button 
to ask any questions at any time. Feel free to ask those as they occur to you and we'll answer them via the Q&A box or let you know we'll answer them live after the demo. To copy and save your questions and answers, simply right click on them and copy and save to your desktop or document. And uh, next slide. Now, is this webinar right for you? This is really a webinar for developers, but if you're not a developer, you're welcome to stay or you can check out DocuSign 101 um, at events.docusign.com slash DocuSign 101. And I'm gonna drop that into the chat here for you. Uh, and then next slide. And this is just our safe harbor notice. So all of the values, email addresses, keys, secrets, tokens, or other personal information you might see here today are for demo purposes only, and will be deleted or revoked after the webinar. Now you should see a quick poll on your screen in just a moment. If you can answer those questions, that will help us understand where you are in your development journey and enable us to customize content for this in future webinars. Okay, so that's it for housekeeping. Let's go ahead and get started. Take it away, Brendan. Uh, Brendan, I think you're on mute. I sure am. Thank you for that. There wouldn't be a, a hybrid work presentation without that reminder. So thank you, um, Melissa, for a great introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm just going to also say thank you to all these speaker panelists who are going to help with the Q&A at the end. These are an awesome group of folks who have done an incredible amount of work to enable the cross-origin resource sharing for all of you uh, to use. And thank you for, for joining us today. It's awesome to see over 90 folks take time out of your days to come learn about cores. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to turn my camera off. I just wanted to quickly say hello but let's save some bandwidth and make sure this presentation goes as smoothly as possible. Okay, so quick overview of our agenda. Again, we're here talking about building a single page app with cores or cross origin resource sharing. We'll start off talking about single page apps, same origin policy and cross origin resource sharing and how they all interconnect. We'll share a little bit about the developer demand, the feedback we heard from all of you, that drove us to implement this feature. We'll provide a high level overview of the product experience built around cores through some screenshots, and then we'll transition into a live demo of cores showing a single page app running entirely on the client, directly connecting to DocuSign eSignature REST APIs through cores. Then we'll talk a little bit about packaging and pricing, share some additional resources to let you continue your course learning journey with us here at DocuSign. And then we'll end, as we mentioned, with Q&A. So please do take note of the questions you have as we go through this. We're very eager to engage with you all at the end. So without further ado, let's dive in. So let's start off with single page apps, same origin policy, and cross-origin resource sharing. So a quick introduction to these three topics. So single page apps, most of you are probably familiar, but it helps to ensure that, that we're all on the same page with these high level concepts. So single page apps, they're types of web apps that load single web documents, then subsequent updates to those apps in the document occur through JavaScript APIs. This is typically when customers are interacting, interacting with the app or when there are asynchronous events that occur her and JavaScript is used to handle those events, they drive this, this uh, dynamic updating of the single page. Same origin policy is a browser enforced policy that protects user privacy by restricting the JavaScript that is used to build single page apps to communicating only with endpoints using the same origin. And we'll talk a little bit more about what exactly origins are in a moment. And there's cross origin resource sharing which lets single page apps or JavaScript that is used to build them securely escape same origin policy and communicate with other endpoints or other origins. So these three technologies taken together complete the core story. And the diagram here on the right, you can see an origin as an example is the HTTPS dsapp.tally.com. 
wanting to communicate with DocuSign's API, which has an origin of HTTPS demo.docusign.com. And when Chorus is in play, that communication is allowed. So let's dive a little bit deeper into each one of these topics. So first, let's take a closer look at single page apps in comparison to traditional web apps. So first, we'll start by talking about some typical characteristics, typical technologies you might see when using single page apps versus traditional web apps, some traditional use cases for each, and then core's applicability. So first, typical characteristics, single page apps. They tend to have simpler server side and more complex client side setups, complex and dynamic user experience. They tend to work only with JavaScript and they can be harder to implement some aspects of web apps like state management, navigation and search engine optimization. You compare that to traditional web apps, which tend to have simpler client side and more complex server side setups, simpler, more static UI, they can work without JavaScript, although very popularly you'll see them using technologies like jQuery. And certain horizontal aspects like navigation, again, state management and SEO are easier to manage with traditional web apps. In terms of technologies, on the client side for SPAs, you'll see Angular, React, and Vue, more complex client side frameworks. On the server, you'll typically see simpler implementations, often with Node, or simple Java, PHP, or .NET setups. For databases, this is where there is similarity uh, between the two types of web apps. You'll see local storage, so client-only storage for single page apps, typically also MySQL and PostgreSQL. For traditional web apps, you see more vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with jQuery thrown in, a technology that's over two decades old, but still going strong. You'll see more complex server setups with server frameworks like JSF, Symfony, ASP.NET, depending on your language of choice, and databases like Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server. And then in terms of use cases, for single page apps, modern enterprise or line of business apps are popular use cases where modern browsers, sort of the latest cutting edge browsers and technologies are being used. There tends to be simpler auth and security requirements Storing security tokens, for instance, on the client um, is often less secure than storing them on a server on the back end. And often you'll see single page apps used to display and interact with customer data, but often not store that customer data and certainly not on the client because customer data is often sensitive and requires higher security and authentication uh, boundaries in order to uh, comply with regulations for handling it. And on the traditional web app side, you see traditional web apps used a lot for legacy enterprise or line of business apps where legacy browsers are still supported. And things like Internet Explorer uh, 10 are no longer being serviced or 11, but there are still companies that depend on these browsers and oftentimes can't upgrade because of those legacy dependencies. Oftentimes there'll be more complex auth and security requirements, as mentioned, often relating to handling, processing, and storing customer data through the backends for these traditional web apps. So in terms of applicability for cores, traditional web apps are server-to-server -server API calls. The client will call into a backend, and the backend will directly call an API server. In that case, cores is not needed. No browser is not in play in terms of making the API call. Course comes into play when it's client to server API calls, when the browser is directly connecting to some other endpoint than the one that the single page app is being hosted on. And this is where cores is needed. So this is why we'll focus in this talk on single page apps and how they integrate and utilize cores. So let's transition out to talk a little bit about same origin policy. Again, same origin policy is a browser enforced policy that means code running in the browser can only make requests for content on its same origin. Now, what is an origin? An origin is made up of three parts. The scheme, for instance, HTTP or HTTPS, the domain, localhost, tally.com, demo.ocusign.com, and a port. Though the ports aren't shown here in the examples, they're often implied. For instance, for HTTP, a popular default port is 80 or 8080. And for HTTPS, 443. 
So taken together, same monitoring policy is a security and privacy measure to prevent unintended sharing of sensitive end user information. Things like cookies and session data that are stored in the client once a customer logs into a website, we wanna make sure that that can't leak across website boundaries or origin boundaries. So let's take an example here of a use case where we're enterprise line of business app developers integrating a single page app with DocuSign. In these cases, course is not configured. So we start off in our local development environment. We're building our single page app on origin HTTP localhost. We want to connect to DocuSign's APIs at HTTPS demo.docusign.com. This is not allowed. It's because the scheme is different, HTTP versus HTTPS, and the domain is different, localhost versus demo.docusign.com. Let's take it to the next step. We're done developing locally. We've published our app out to the endpoint where it's hosted, HTTPS, dsapp.tally.com. We want that origin to communicate with HTTPS demo.docusign.com. Now the schemes are the same, HTTPS, but the domains, dsapp.tally.com and demo.docusign.com are different. So this, this communication directly from client to server is also not allowed. Now let's exist in a hypothetical world where DocuSign has a hosting model where we allow integration partners, developers such as yourselves to publish your apps out to our site and we'll host it. For instance, at HTTPS demo.docusign.com slash tally. This would be allowed to communicate with HTTPS demo.docusign.com because the scheme and the domain are the same. However, we don't support this hosting model. We exist in a world where you developers host your apps on your own endpoints and then integrate with DocuSign. So in that world, this is where cross-origin resource sharing is needed. This is the way to work securely around the same origin policy. With cores, if both origins engage in an HTTP header-based handshake with the correct course configuration, the browser allows cross-origin communication. The client starts off by setting an origin header. For instance, origin, HTTP localhost. And the server then responds with a header, which is access control allow origin for the hosts that it does allow. In this example, star means it allows all origins to communicate with it and connect with it. Now that's not the most secure implementation. It is a feasible implementation for certain use cases as we'll see later on in the demo, but typically you want to restrict it to specific origins. So let's again take the use case forward enterprise line of business app developer locally building a single page app integration with DocuSign. In this case, course is configured on the DocuSign side to allow HTTP localhost to connect. Now there's a special type of request that gets kicked off automatically by browsers before the original request that is coded gets sent. And that's called a pre-flight request. What this will do is it will just check to see if cores is enabled so that the handshake can complete. So a first pre-flight request is sent with the origin header. The pre-flight response comes from the server. And if cores is enabled, then additional requests continue after that. So you will see the request that you, for instance, kick off with a JavaScript fetch API with the origin where the single page app is hosted. And then the, the DocuSign API will respond with access control allow origin HTTP localhost. That is the handshake that confirms that that origin who's making the request can communicate with the DocuSign API endpoint. So now that we've talked a little bit about single page apps, same origin policy, and cross-origin resource sharing, and you understand how they interconnect with each other. Let's talk a little bit about why we went and built this feature. Chorus is had high and consistent enterprise and ISV developer demand for years. It originally came out in 2013. APIs have progressively added it over time. We've heard feedback from customers of all sizes asking for Chorus, small, medium, large enterprises, ISVs, across all industries, from finance to manufacturing to automotive to healthcare. We've even had internal requests in addition to all the external feedback we've gotten. Our own DocuSign teams who have apps hosted on different domains that want to communicate with the e-signature REST APIs. Even looking at the popularity of this demo, 
of this webinar. You know, 100 folks showed up to attend this. That's really a clear sign that Cores is in high demand. It's been consistently the top 10 most requested features from our DocuSign developer community. We've had over 40 posts on DocuSign Stack Overflow asking for or about Cores support. And single page app technologies are consistently in the top most popular technologies according to industry wide and respected surveys like Stack Overflow's yearly developer survey, where we see languages like React and Vue and Angular, uh, I'm sorry, frameworks like React, Vue and Angular, and languages like JavaScript and TypeScript consistently showing up in the most popular technologies. So taken together, there's clear demand for this feature. And we thank, thank you for all the feedback you provided. In addition to that, the current experience is a lot of work for all of you to set up. What we mean by that is we published multiple blog posts in the past on how to work around the lack of course. There's an architecture where you can stand up an API gateway where your client app can proxy through a backend and that backend can call DocuSign's e-signature REST APIs without the need of course. But for many of you, you don't want to incur the cost of a backend API. Proxy server, standing that up and running it is expensive. And often you're not unable to process customer data as that requires additional regulatory and compliance requirements that you then have to fulfill and, and, and pay the cost for. So we've heard loud and clear that uh, those two things taken together were justification enough to invest in this feature. And we're really excited to be demoing it for you today and releasing it. So with that, let's take a look at the product experience before we jump into the live demo. So the experience starts off in the DocuSign admin console in the integration section and the apps and keys page. When you go and create a new app and in integration, first thing that you'll want to note is you have to configure it to use implicit grant authentication. This is because we don't yet support Pixie for securely storing tokens on the client. So what we need is an implicit grant authentication type that allows the single page application to act on behalf of a user who's currently logged in. The other new piece of experience on this page is the course configuration section. This is where you can define the origins that will be allowed to access your DocuSign APIs and the methods through which that access can take place. Get, post, put, delete, and head. We also have a new global course page that's similarly in the admin console and integration section. This is where you can come and turn cores on or off uh, for all of your apps, or if cores is not enabled by default for all new apps, turn it on for individual apps one at a time. You can see additional information here like origins that are configured for certain apps and the state of all the apps in terms of whether they allow cores or not. And last is part of the implicit grant authentication flow. This is an experience we're probably all used to having installed Facebook apps or Google apps. Whenever there's an implicit grant or act on behalf of flow, the application needs to get permission from the end user to utilize certain capabilities, uh, scopes, we call them. And so this is an experience that the user of the app will see. They need to consent to allowing direct cores API calls and any other scopes that are needed by the application. This is an existing experience within DocuSign that cores just snaps into. And for instance, in the My Profile Connected Apps view, you can go and revoke the access for any app that is using cores, just like you can with any other integration. So again, taken together, we have experiences in the admin console, and we've integrated with the implicit grant authentication flow and connected app management experiences. So with that, let's transition into a live demo. I'll switch my shared screen here. This demo is gonna start off in the admin console. Now, just really quick, here's a summary of what we're gonna show. We'll show a sample single page app built entirely client side in CodePen working with cores. We'll show creating a new app that will support cores requests, configuring the app to allow cores requests from certain origins and for specific HTTP methods, configuring the app to accept cores requests, and last, a successful request from that single page app to DocuSign eSignature REST API to fetch and display sent envelopes of the active logged in user. So that demo is going to start here in the integrations apps and keys page. 
Again, I'm going to adopt the persona and use case of being a line of business app developer. Let's go ahead and add a new app and integration key. Now I'm going to build this sent envelope view app for my sales team. So sales envelope send line of business. We'll go ahead and create that app. Now, when we land in the app configuration experience, again, the first thing we have to do is change this to implicit grant. We'll talk a little bit more about implicit grant and what the code setup looks like in just a minute. The next thing we have to do is for this demo, we need to configure a redirect URI. This is important for implicit grant flows. Um, again, we'll highlight this a little bit more as we take a look at the code behind the authentication setup. Let's go ahead and save that. Now we'll jump into the code for authentication setup. One of the first things we want to do is find our integration key that we just created and add it to our authentication file. Now this file contains a few classes that will be used by our single page app to make authentication and API calling easier. Those three modules are the implicit grant class, user info class, and call API class. All these code pens are available for you to take a look at later, so don't worry. We'll link to these and, and you can go in and dive into this code even more after this webinar. But a few things to call out. The first is the integration with the implicit grant through scopes. This single page app is going to use the signature and core scope. So signature is going to allow the app to call and receive the sent envelopes. And cores is going to show on that permissions consent prompt that this app needs to allow cores APIs direct requests to the e-signature APIs. Now there's also a class in here, again, called user info. Now this is a handy helper class because it's gonna aggregate a bunch of information about the currently logged in user that can be used for making API requests. And what's interesting to note is that this API endpoint, which up here is the OAuth auth endpoint, is also configured to support cores. So if we come down into the user info class and we look at the fetch user info method, you can see that in this fetch call, we're configuring it to use cores. Now this endpoint is one of the one use cases where it makes sense to have the access control allow origin set to star because we want all origins to be able to call into this endpoint in order to get authentication set up. The last class in here is the call API class. What it does is it wraps API calls and adds common headers, including when fetch is called a mode that defines that it should use cores. Now, one interesting thing to note here is for demo purposes, we've added this parameter, this configuration option to the fetch request but fetch by default will set cores as its mode. So you don't have to include this if you don't want to. So again, what we just showed here is implicit grant setup with an implicit grant class to help with authentication, user info class that makes it easy to fetch the current login user's information, and call API, which wraps all API calls with the right headers to make invoking our APIs seamless. So now let's transition to take a look at the actual single page app itself. Now, the first thing to note in here is the login with DocuSign button. When we click that, that's going to trigger the implicit grant authentication flow. That will pop open a new window, which will show that permission consent screen. And again, here you can see the allow direct cores API calls from the web browser that maps to the cores scope and the create and send envelopes and obtain links for starting signing sessions, which maps to the signature scope. We'll go ahead and say allow access. Let's go back here. I might've included a typo in my URL that I copied. So sometimes live demos are fraught with issues. Let's just make sure we've got this configured right. Go ahead and save that. Try this one more time. All right, so now we're brought back to our single page application. 
Now, what just happened is we redirected to that redirect URI behind the scenes. That pop-up window is automatically closed. And now we're acting on behalf of the currently logged in user, my demo account. Now let's pop open the F12 developer tools so we can take a look at some of how these fetch requests work with cores. So we'll click send envelope status to try to load those envelopes. Well, we're actually gonna see that request error out, but there's a couple interesting things happening here. One, you can see the pre-flight request. Uh, it's designated as a special initiator. We didn't actually call the fetch request in order to trigger this. The browser automatically triggered it for us. And then we see the actual request that we sent. And there are a couple of interesting things to pay attention here. First is in the request. We come down and look at the origin. It's set to HTTPS cdpn.io. Now this is an important thing to pay attention to as you configure origins for cores. Sometimes the URL showed here is not the URL used to make the request. So if you notice an error, it's important to make sure that those two things align and you can make sure that they do by checking them out in the developer tools. The next thing is to see the 403 forbidden response. This is what will return when course is not configured. So it's a clear telltale sign they have yet to set course up. And last is in the response headers, we don't see access control allow origin. Again, that's because course is not configured. So let's go ahead and configure course. We'll come back into our admin console, back into this integration. We'll scroll down to the bottom to the new course configuration section. We'll first add that origin, which is HTTPS cdpn.io. And for demo purposes, again, I'm gonna enter an incorrect origin. This error is telling me, again, that this is not a valid origin URL. Again, an origin is scheme, so HTTPS, domain, and then port, which again is implied here to be 443 because it's HTTPS. The issue is that we've added a trailing slash, which indicates a URL path. And URL paths are not part of origins. So if we delete that slash, the error will go away. So again, another important thing to pay attention to as you enter URLs or copy and paste them. And then last, we're going to configure the allowed HTTP method. We're just going to use Git and to apply great security principles, such as least privilege, we're only going to enable the methods that we're actually going to use. So go ahead and click Save. That will save our configuration. We'll come back here. We'll try again. Huh, that's still failing. Well, that's also by design. There's one more step you have to configure in order to make sure course works. We'll come back here. We'll go back to the integration section. And we'll take a look at the course page. This is the, again, the location where you can globally enable or disable course. Course will be on by default on this page for all accounts. On by default does not mean working by default. You do have to add origins and allow HTTP methods for it to work. But you can also come down and turn on course for individual apps. And here you can see our sales envelope send line of business app that we just created is off. So if we go ahead and toggle that, click enable, course will now be fully configured. The allowed origins, the allowed HTTP methods, and now course is turned on. So when we come back in and we click this button one more time, we'll see that the request completes successfully and the data loads. So we're now able to make that direct call. Now again, a couple things to note here in the developer tools. One, again, the origin we sent is HTTPS cdpn.io. We now get a 200 OK status code because the request succeeded. And we see the allow or the access control allow origin header, which is HTTPS cdpn.io or the value that we entered inside of our configuration experience. So to summarize, here's what we just saw. To enable and use cores, you have to set your auth mode to implicit grant, add allowed origins and used HTTP request methods, make a request to the API, and then go enable cores for the app unless it's enabled by default for all apps. And with that, let's jump back into the remainder of the presentation. Okay, so let's talk briefly about packaging and pricing. This one is pretty simple. Course functionality is available at no extra cost, out of the box, on all plans that support API access. It's also available for accounts without admin type users. 
it'll be enabled by default in those accounts. There are two accounts though that do not yet have cores access. That's FedRAMP and IL-4. We want to assess demand post GA launch today, and we can add support for these in the future. So please, if you need support on these accounts, do let us know. We'd love to have your feedback. Next, before we jump into Q&A, let's talk about some helpful resources that will enable you to continue your learning journey with Course. All the great folks that have helped out with us have contributed a bunch of great content for you to continue that learning journey. First is DocuSign University course. We have a course on building a custom e-signature integration with course that is very similar to the demo we just saw. We have a few blogs announcing the release of course, diving deep into OAuth setup for course applications, and then building a bulletproof course application, including tests, authentication setup, and all the different aspects of the demo we just showed. There are also some developer docs covering single page applications in cores, enabling or disabling cores for your apps, and then configuring your app in the apps and keys page. We have code pens out there that you can go take a look at, fork and play around with. We have some how-to guides for common use cases like requesting a signature by email using course or requesting a signature through your course enabled browser app. And then admin guides for those who are administering DocuSign accounts on cross-origin resource sharing for applications, how to use the experiences we just took a look at. And last, the release notes uh, for cores are included in the 23.1.02 release or the May 2023 release. And with that, we'll transition into Q&A. All right, thanks so much, Brendan. Uh, Cole and team, do you have any questions from the the group that uh, might benefit everybody. Oh, sorry, was on mute there as well. But let me grab um, a few. And it looks like there's also sorry, a few that just came into the chat. One is is JWT auth allowed with cores. Brendan, did you have any input on that? Um, I'd love to turn this over to one of our panelists. So Tony um, or Sam, would you be able to jump in on that one? Yeah, currently JWT is not supported. Uh, we only support kind of like the implicit grant for now. Perfect. And then I know it looks like some of the, the more common ones we've seen in general was around the e-signature API methods, and I think you would touch based on that, but just to clarify, is it correct that all of the general e-signature API methods support cores? So it is the e-signature REST v2.1 uh, methods that support cores. The OAuth um, and uh, um, user info endpoints also support it, um, but in particular, it is the e-signature REST v B2.1 API methods that support course. Okay, perfect. And I think there are a few questions that are right now being pasted into the chat. So we could try to get some of those answered live. One of them looks potentially a little bit more around a, uh, could you use URL to the course tutorial? I'm not sure I totally understand the question. So if there might be a little more context added to that. Oh, it looks like there was. Uh, that is, could you post URL to the CORE's tutorial? If that's in regards to the actual call today, um, I believe Melissa at the end and jump in, Melissa, if that's incorrect, they should be sent over as a recording. Yeah, we'll be sending the recording along with all the resources that we've covered here today about a week following the webinar. So watch your email. Perfect. Uh, and then are any admin APIs allowed to use cores? I see is another one in here. As long Good as question. they're used, as long as the, the, the Kennedy in the path and uh, they're using the B2.1, then we should be supported. Just as long as it's a REST API. Yeah. I think there are a, a, a couple uh, API methods where it is not supported, which is the accounts get provisioning 
billing plans, resource, and diagnostics and notary categories. Uh, those currently do not support cores. Perfect. There's one, are we able to get tokens as response? I'm not sure if I totally understand, but if that might be something that sounds familiar to someone else, feel free to jump in. If not, then we might need a little bit of elaboration on the ask there. There might be, we probably need more clarity on that question. Okay. Yeah. In regards to what, type, what types of tokens and what APIs are you calling? Uh, that would be helpful. Sounds great. And then the version of the REST API, is it correct that the 2.1 is required? That's correct. OK, sounds great. And I see a new one that just came through, the allow cores prompt screen that we saw before being able to call the REST API. Would each end user see this screen? They have to click, or do they have to click the yellow button themselves? I'm guessing that yes. was the consent. Yeah. Yep. Great question. And, and every end user of the app does have to consent. Um, and, and that's a, a traditional experience for the implicit grant authentication flow because the single page app will have scopes beyond just cores that it needs in terms of accessing certain APIs. And Chorus is just one of the scopes there, but yes, the end users will have to consent uh, to granting um, the application to sort of act on behalf of them. Uh, so yes, every end user will have to go through that flow. Okay. Can that prompt screen be configured to company standards? The consent screen, as far as I'm aware, isn't configurable. It typically is going to be that yellow grant consent box, but feel free to jump in anyone if that is something that you're aware of that is configurable. That is a great question. I am I'm personally not sure about that. Does anyone else on the Q&A panel know the answer? I'm not aware on that point. Likewise. I, I'm pretty certain just from the developer support perspective, not just specific to cores, that consent screen typically wouldn't be something that you're able to alter. We have our resource files, which will allow altering the visibility of different aspects of the platform, but the consent screen doesn't exist inside of that resource file. Um, and then I see another one, the cores migration. Will it migrate from a developer account to production once you've promoted the integration key? Great question. So no, like all app uh, and uh, integration key configuration, uh, demo and prod are separate. So you will have to recreate the, the course configuration in prod once your app is promoted. Sounds great. And I'm just looking again through that chat window. Can the prompt screen be configured? And then there's just a note token information by anonymous attendees. So I don't know if there was some prior context to that one, but uh, let's Looks back. like folks helping each other out there. Appreciate whoever uh, shared those links. Thank you for sharing those. For sure. And there was, a, there was a good question around, can we use localhost on demo? Yes, great, great question. So uh, localhost on demo is supported, um, both HTTP and HTTPS. And that's because the browser actually treats HTTP localhost much as HTTPS localhost. Um, it will auto configure sort of behind the scenes secure connectivity. So for demo, yes, we do allow HTTP localhost and HTTPS. Uh, for prod, we do not allow localhost connections. I have a question, um, is cores available today and is there any issue that's known that would impact functionality? Yeah, great question. So cores is available today in demo. Uh, there is a bug that we are working to release that we anticipate will land around uh, mid-June that is impacting its usability in prod. 
So you can start integrating your apps with it in demo and, and testing things out and, and building the promotion to prod will have to wait until after that fix is released in mid June. We are trying to see if we can speed up that release, but that's how it stands today. Okay, another one that just came in full. Yeah, it looks like, could you make the case of cores versus API wrapper calling DocuSign as far as enhanced security or experience? What would be the worst thing about cores versus API wrapper approach? I see. I think this is about the uh, different architecture of sort of an uh, API gateway for calling DocuSign APIs versus directly calling from the browser. Um, it's a great question. So typically, um, you know, because of some of the browser security patterns like same origin policy and cores that are in place, uh, security is comparable. Now, there are areas where they're not comparable. For instance, storing a uh, token, uh, an auth token on the client is not recommended because it is not a secure encrypted experience. Uh, there are technologies like Pixie, PKCE, we don't yet support that will enable storing tokens securely. Um, but for now, if you do have to store an authentication token, for instance, you have to use some other flow than implicit grant um, like JWT, please do use the backend server implementation uh, to securely store that token. Um, another use case for using that backend API proxy to call the, the APIs directly uh, is again, if you are processing customer data and that's purposeful. Uh, and you want that data to be stored and tracked and logged on a backend system. So those are some examples of where you might use uh, one model of directly calling the APIs versus uh, via cores versus the backend proxy. But in general, uh, they are two different options that you should just ensure you use based on your requirements. And I see Tony and Sam are also jumping in to add a little more flavor there. So thank you guys. Okay, um, oh, another question just popped in. Yeah, DocuSign.js is in beta version on site. So shall we can use this in our app or how? Uh, that might be, I don't know if that's specific to cores. If it's regarding the SDK, um, I think we do have some general documentation on that SDK, but again, for products in a beta version, there is a limit to its overall functionality and the documentation on it. Uh, I'll see if I can find a link and then can type an answer to that one. I can also add in on the Pakistan JS one. I think that one is is different purpose than utilizing together with e-signatures cores capabilities. Like it was designed uh basically to go through a proxy for all DocuSign APIs. And I also think it's in maintenance mode. So I don't know that that's the one you would want to spend time uh looking at. Okay, thanks, Joey. The next question from Jenna. Yeah, is it correct that when developing locally using localhost, that regardless of grant type, cores has to be enabled, configured when using any v2.1 DocuSign API? Yes. So other than the the user info and the OAuth APIs, which have uh, API methods which have um, the access control allow origin set to star, which is any origin. Yes, if you're developing on localhost and you want to call any of the e-signature REST API methods that are part of the v2.1 version, you will need to go and set up cores uh, through the admin UI. That, that is, that the, the point I want to clearly or specify there is that when you're making calls from the browser to the DocuSign REST API, that's when cores is required. If Correct. you're making calls from your local host to a server or a proxy, not cores is not relevant in that scenario. 
Correct. Great call out. And then a new one, can this be used with DocuSign CLM as well? Or is there a use case for using this with DocuSign CLM? I, mean, I do know that Doc. Do. Oh, go ahead, please. I believe currently we only support the eSign REST API, uh, so not the CLM API. I do know that CLM APIs support cores. I do not know, though, the configuration uh, experience for those. That is a great question uh, and one we should follow up on. But um, to uh, what was just said, we uh, do not configure cores through the experience we just showed for the CLM APIs. Okay, um, it looks like we don't have any others in the queue. Um, one of the more common questions I think is, um, in what account types is CORE supported? Sure. Yeah, so uh, all account types except for FedRAMP and IL-4. Um, and CORE works in demo and production accounts um, outside of those two account types. Okay, thanks. And these are great questions. Thank you all for, for asking these, fantastic. Yep, uh, let's see, is CORS available for accounts without admin type users? Yes, it is, and it will be enabled by default for those accounts. And kind of a follow-up to that, um, can someone disable CORS for accounts without admin type users? That is a great question. Can someone on the panel speak to that? See, we currently have it set that the account admin is the one who has control over that setting. Yeah. So if your account so, admin, if your account doesn't want you to, uh, any of the accounts to be using, or your users be using cores, they can disable that in the admin portal. Okay. Um... Let's see. Will course configuration migrate from demo to prod when the app is promoted? Yeah, great question. Um, it will not. Uh, like all other app uh, key configuration settings, um, you'll have to re-implement re them uh, in uh, prod. Great, thanks, Brandon. What types of origins are not allowed? Uh, the origins that are not allowed are particular to environment, such as localhost is not allowed in production. Um, beyond that, uh, folks on the panel, any additional origins that are not allowed? So when you're specifying your origins, it has to be, uh, there, there cannot be any wildcards or things like that as a security standard. Yeah, we want you to explicitly list out your origins. So that's the main thing is that no wildcards in, in your origins. So no use of asterisk as we saw uh, in the demo. We need you to be specific. Yep. Yeah. Great call out. In, in addition, any of your origins cannot include the like a request path. So uh, Brendan mentioned earlier, it can only be the host, the domain, and then uh, the .com or .net or such as those. And a port. Yeah, and a port. We are okay. only also only allowing uh, links that start with HTTPS just for the security additions that it gives. And that's in prod, right? But in, yeah. in uh, demo, you can do HTTP localhost just because the way the browser uh, auto configures that to be like HTTPS localhost. Yeah, that would be the exception. But yes, we highly recommend always using secure connections. You're transmitting customer data ultimately. So always HTTPS or HTTP localhost because it automatically is configured securely. I think there was one more question that came in. Um, Cole, did you want to cover that one? Yeah, I was just typing up an answer there. It, it's unrelated to cores around a developer account, but uh, we've seen in the developer support team issues like that in the past. Oftentimes, if you're using 
a company domain, like my first dot last name at mycompany.com, trying with a standard at Gmail email might resolve that. The email shouldn't ultimately cause any issues if you have a different email in production, but if using a different email doesn't work or you are needing for some reason to use the specific email, I'd suggest creating a case with support for that one. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, was there anything related to the 403 forbidden error that you didn't cover? Sure, yeah. So as, as mentioned, uh, 403 forbidden is what we return when uh, cores is not configured, but that does assume that there are no other issues in place. And so there can be other reasons why a 403 may be returned. Um, if there are, again, app configuration issues uh, for cores, um, if the uh, port, uh, you know, the, the origin is, is not configured correctly, you might get a 403. Um, if you haven't enabled cores for the application, you might get a 403. If you haven't specified the core scope uh, during authentication, you could get a 403. Um, so there are indeed uh, a number of reasons. Another one is if the e-signature REST API is not version 2.1, uh, you can get a 403. Um, if the API you're calling does not include accounts slash the account ID, um, which is the, sort of the, the uh, um, I, I believe as uh, Sam or, or Tony mentioned earlier, um, is the required sort of the API parameter, you can get a 403. So those are all a bunch of, of things to check when you get a 403, you can cycle through those and ensure that all of those uh, are correct in order to resolve that issue. All right, great. Well, thank you everybody for the great questions and um, Brendan and team for the great presentation and demo. Uh, we can go ahead and um, if you could go back to the resources slide, that would be fabulous. All right, so we covered a ton of stuff today and all of these resources, as we said, will be uh, included uh, with links in our follow-up email that we'll send about a week from today, along with the recording. Um, if there are more questions that you have, um, please feel free to reach out to us at developers at docdesign.com after today's webinar and this team will follow up with you. You can also go to Stack Overflow and tag them with DocuSign API for a community response. Um, or uh, you can attend one of our upcoming additional webinars. Uh, API Office Hours Live from Seattle will run on June 13th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we have offerings around the globe as well in Australia June 1st and Brazil June 6th. Um, be sure to take the post webinar survey as you exit today. Tell us how we did and what you'd like to see for future webinars. So, um, oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, finally today, I would just like to thank, um, Brendan for leading the webinar, Tony, Samuel, Simon, and Cole for addressing all the great questions that came in today. And I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, have a great remainder of the day, everyone, and uh, happy coding. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank everyone. you, Melissa. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.